This evening we're turning to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Now, a little bit different than I normally do. I normally would uh, read the portion that we're going to be preaching on. Uh, but this evening I'm not going to do that because we're going to just take it a couple of verses at a time. This may sound to you like a history lesson. And it is a history lesson. Don't be afraid of history. As uh, A.T. Pearson said, A.T. Pearson, by the way, was uh, an American pastor who was called to England uh, after the death of uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And he pastored the great uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle, which Spurgeon was for a long time, and uh, uh, just preached some phenomenal messages there, ministered to the people for two years, and was greatly, greatly blessed. A.T. Pearson used to say that history is his story. His story. And this is a perfect example of that. You need to remember that uh, Gabriel has come to Daniel and we find that in chapter 10, because Daniel had been praying. He had been fasting. Uh, his heart was uh, in, in deep sorrow and grief and also concern, uh, both for the Jewish people who had been allowed to go back to Jerusalem, as God had promised, about 50,000 of them. And, uh, but they had been going through some very difficult times. Uh, there was a lot of opposition to their rebuilding of the temple. Uh, the neighbors around uh, them uh, didn't want that to happen, didn't want it to take place, and so they were in opposition. I believe also that Daniel was very concerned uh, with those Jewish people who never left Babylon. They had settled down there, they had homes and families and businesses and farms and all those things, and so they were content. They were content to stay in a pagan land. And uh, I suppose we could maybe say it was, would be like the Jewish people when uh, they were still in the wilderness, and God brought them uh, to uh, Canaan land, to Palestine eventually would be called, and they would have just said, well, no, I think we'll stay back over here. It's kind of nicer over there. In fact, in the wilderness, that's exactly what they said to God, didn't they? They wanted to go back to Egypt, to bondage, to the leeks and the garlic, uh, instead of going where God wanted them to go. And so he had a great burden. Well, God sends Gabriel. And uh, Gabriel, I believe it's Gabriel, anyway, great uh, angel of God. And uh, he comes with a message for Daniel. Uh, and his message is to tell Daniel what will happen in the future. Uh, now, the first thing that actually happens uh, is that, uh, which already had taken place, was that uh, the king of, uh, the, uh, of uh, Babylon, who was now ruled by the Persians, Cyrus, uh, would allow the Jewish people uh, Darius, I say, allow the Jewish people to go back to uh, uh, Jerusalem. Well, then God tells him what is going to come next. Now, as we look at this, most of this is already past now. We're looking at it thousands of years later. And the wonderful thing, though, is, is that as you look at this, you see that this is prophecy. This is exact prophecy, as I hope to show you tonight, and we'll go as far as we can. And when we look at this, we see that God gave this prophecy, delivered it to Daniel, and all of it was totally fulfilled. All of this was going to be in advance. It was going to be future. Now we look back and we see how exact it was. I'm talking about exact and now we look, and of course, 
the latter part of the whole message, which we won't get there tonight, is the message of what will happen to the Jewish people at the end of the church age when we have the tribulation period and then, of course, the millennial kingdom. And so when we look at this and we see it and we see all this fulfilled prophecy, we then say, wow, look at how exact that was. That is absolutely perfect. No one could do this but God. That also tells us that what God has in store for the Jewish people in the future that hasn't taken place will take place. Now, the liberals, the modernists, the ones who don't want to believe that the Bible is truly God's word, deny that Daniel was actually written when it was written. They claim it was written much, much later because they said no one could have told all and predicted all of these things that would take place. And so they give it a much later date. And, uh, but the problem is that it wasn't written much later. It was written at the time of Daniel. Uh, and so uh, that's something that uh, the liberal scholars uh, are always attacking. Uh, this is one of the books in the Bible, along with the first part of Genesis and some other places that they love to attack. Uh, but the problem is they have no basis for it. And praise the Lord, we can study it today and we can really understand and see the prophecy. Now, what I've handed out to you, and I actually almost gave you a much more detailed, much longer one, but uh, I thought, no, I'm not going to overwhelm you. This isn't a uh, history of um, the, the uh, ancient world, uh, a two, two, uh, two hour uh, college course for two semesters. So we're going to cover as much as you can. Now, if you look at that, uh, I know the print is a little small, but you will see in, in a, a little corner underneath the names of these kings and, and stuff, you'll see a little number and that you'll see those are the, the verse numbers. All right. So that's what you're going to be looking at there. So. The prophetic history of Israel among the nations is described here in Daniel chapter 11. Now, it falls into four major divisions. Uh, first of all is the prophecies concerning Persia. That's verses 1 and 2. Second is the prophecies concerning Greece. And that's verses 3 and 4. The third is prophecies concerning Egypt and Syria, and that's verses 5 through 35. And finally, the prophecies concerning the Antichrist, that will be during the tribulation period. So that is something in the future. But as we look at this, we're going to see that God fulfills all of these prophecies. All of this history takes place except for that, and we know that this eventually also will take place. Now, also let me just mention to you that verse 1 actually belongs with chapter 10. Some people don't know this, but the Bible was not written in chapters. It was written in books, straight through, other than the Psalms. Now, the Psalms were separate. Uh, there is a possibility the Proverbs probably were some too. But all the rest was just written all the way across. And a long, long time ago, uh, there was uh, an individual who divided the Bible into chapters and made it a little bit easier, divided it into verses. And so with those verses, uh, we sometimes even have a little bit of a difficulty because they will divide a section that maybe shouldn't have been divided. And when you, when you read, let me just say to you, when you read Paul, uh, if you pay attention to it uh, and really pay attention to what you're doing, you'll notice that he just keeps on going on and on and on and on and on and on. And we have colons and 
we have commas and all this stuff because it's just a really long sentence oftentimes. And uh, so uh, we try to break it up. That way it's easier for us to find the verses when you, when you look for them. Well, I think that's enough uh, introduction at this point. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for every opportunity we have of worship, every opportunity to open your word as a part of our worship, to be able to uh, study your truth, your word, to come to know thee better, and to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We thank you for the prophecies that were given to Daniel and that he wrote them down at your instructions, at your direction, so that we might be able to see how you told him what would come to pass and all, all those things that have come to pass have come and those who haven't yet, we know that we, they will come to pass as well. I pray that you will bless our time in the Word this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. So our beginning, our, our study begins this evening with the prophecies concerning Persia. Now, as I mentioned, verse 1 really should go with chapter 10 because uh, Gabriel is speaking here to Daniel in verse 21 of chapter 10, he says, I will, but I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And so that, we believe, is that he's telling Daniel that it was him who influenced Darius, who was a pagan king, to actually fulfill what God had promised, and that there was that the Jewish people would be allowed to go back after 70 years of captivity to go back to Jerusalem. Darius didn't do this with any other peoples who were captured by them and the Babylonians. These were the only people who were allowed to go back to their land. And so it's an amazing thing. Uh, and uh, now, in this, uh, these two verses now here, uh, only two events in the long and, and really glorious history of the ancient Persian Empire are mentioned. Now, the Persian Empire lasted from 539 to 331 B.C. That's before Christ. Now, first, Daniel, Gabriel mentioned his strengthening of Darius uh, in his first year. So he said, I stood up and confirmed and strengthened him. That was the year that Babylon was conquered and Persia, the Medio Persians, came to power. The Medes at first and then the Persians took over completely. And though the purpose of the angelic ministry is not stated, it, I think it can be assumed that this was the direct result of the decree was issued permitting the Jews to return to Judah, and you find that in Ezra chapter 1. And so it opens up with the illustration of the influence that God's angel has on the history of his people, but also has on history and nations and kings. The Bible says that the king uh, is in the Lord's hand and he moves him anywhere that he wants him, gets him to do whatever he wants. Now, the second event that Gabriel described is the future for Daniel, all right? Daniel has already lived through verse 1. Now he gives him in verse 2 what is future. In fact, the message begins at this point. So verse 2 says, And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the four shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Now, there were more than four 
uh, Persian kings. You look at the dates there, how long that was and everything. Obviously, there was much more. But God only concentrates on these four and emphasizes this final one here. This final one is by the name of Xerxes. His name starts with an X, all right? And there are other Xerxes, and then they'll have different first names. Some of them have a, uh, or last name, some of them have a, a, a portion that is before their name, some after their name. And uh, he gathered an army of more than two and a half million men to invade Greece. Now, at this time, no one would have thought much of Greece. Greece was city-states. Uh, it wasn't a nation. It wasn't an empire. All right? Uh, but the, and this took place uh, during the time of Xerxes' rule, he ruled from 486 to 465 B.C. The invasion was ill-fated uh, uh, adventure. He was defeated. Imagine that, that many men, two and a half million men, and he's still defeated. And uh, there were two very famous battles that took place. And one of them was when uh, 300, I think they were Spartans or whatever, stood against them and, and uh, all died. But they so were so valiant and they were in such a place that they almost wiped out you know, a whole army. It was incredible what took place there. Now, the Greeks won. But they never would forget that invasion. And so for years, they longed to bring revenge upon the Persians. So God then moves on to the prophecies concerning Greece. And we find these in verses 3 and 4. Then a mighty king shall arise and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he has risen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his prosperity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. This prophecy is a prophecy of a man that you have heard of in the past. His name was Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was probably one of the most capable uh, generals who ever lived. Uh, his father was uh, Philip II of Macedonia. Uh, it was just a small little kingdom, no big deal. But Alexander began to go forth and he began to conquer. And he kept on amassing a larger and a larger army. And he began, he, he really brought all of the Greek uh, city-states together. And then he went on and he went across. He came into what we call Asia Minor or what you would call today Turkey. And then he goes through and he just begins to conquer and conquer and conquer. Now, he reigned only from 356 to 323 B.C. He was a very young man. Uh, so remember now, they wanted to retaliate, and he's the one who retaliates against the Persians by conquering this vast empire. If you will, take your Bibles and turn back in Daniel to chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. In Daniel chapter 8, if you will remember the vision, <clears throat> verses 4 through 8. <clears throat> He said, I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, three directions, all right, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen, and standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. 
I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground, trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, a large horns was broken. In place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. This latter part is describing Alexander the Great. And we'll get back to some of this in a moment. Then go over to verse 20. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Medes and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. Now, going back to Daniel and chapter 11. Alexander's life and career was cut short. He died at a very young age. He was only in his 30s. When he, he literally captured from Greece, or Europe if you put it, all the way down to India. At that point, he believed there was nothing more to conquer, and he literally wept. There's all sorts of speculation on how he died, uh, but he died very young. And his kingdom was divided. And for a number of years, there was wars going on. And eventually, four of his uh, generals rose up to the top, and they divided all of his kingdom. Now, in future years, this event would have dire results for the Jewish people and the Jewish nation. Now, you'll notice here that um, uh, his, it says that he ruled his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. So, even though... He had ruled all that. Others would rule, not him. Next comes the prophecies concerning Egypt and Syria. And I'm not going to, we'll read these little by little as we go along, all right? But this is chapter, verses 5 through 35. So Gabriel only speaks of two of the four divisions of Alexander's empire. And those two great uh, empires that will have warfare. And the reason that he talks about them is one is of the north of Israel, one is of the south of Israel. Israel's in the middle. The other two empires don't have anything to do with Jerusalem, don't have anything to do with Israel, and so God doesn't discuss them. Now, these two divisions that God talks about here is Syria. It was ruled by Seleucus uh, and many who are known by that name. He was one of Alexander's generals, and he was one of his successors. So that's one. And Egypt is ruled by Ptolemy. Now, I always like to remind people that Ptolemy is spelled with a P, but the P is silent. It's kind of like the G in Scolione. Okay? <laughs> Just want to let you know about that one. He was another of Alexander's generals and his successor. And it's important to observe that the warfare between these two dynasties greatly affected the Jewish people because of where they were located. It also should be kept in mind that they were bet uh, that. Uh, uh, that, that the detail of the prophetic record is not without its purpose. 
The early kings are described to provide a background for a fellow by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes is, is a flamboyant title, all right, that they take for themselves. He will rule from 175 to 164 BC, but he does ex incredible damage. Uh, he's given ample attention for one reason. He foreshadows the Antichrist of the old end times. The movement of this chapter is toward those two significant personages who dramatically affect the faith of the Jews. So what I'm going to do is divide this up into periods. Uh, we'll go as far as we can this evening, then we'll continue on next time, Lord willing. Uh, they have to do with Egypt and Syria. Period 1 goes from 323 B.C. to 246 B.C., and that is found in verses 5 and 6. It says, also the king of the south, the south, speaking of Egypt, all right, Egypt is south of Israel, shall become strong as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And at the end of some years they shall join forces, for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of her authority, and neither he nor his authority shall stand. But she shall be given up with those who brought her, and with him who begot her, and with him who strengthened her in those times. So here we are introduced to these two rival kings. One is Ptolemy. Ptolemy and his uh, family will rule Egypt for a long time. Uh, he will have different names. And, uh, and so he's in Egypt. He's, of course, the first one is the first to rule. He was a general. Now, it says here that one of his princes, that is one of his captains, uh, will outstrip him in power and become the head of the Seleucid dynasty. Seleucus was the first of Syria. What happened is that this general, we know this from history now, this general actually uh, was on the other side. And uh, he had helped uh, conquer a large area for Syria and uh, for Seleucus, but when it was all over with, he was given no power, no authority, no nothing over all these things that he conquered. And so he rebelled and he went to Egypt. He becomes a, just a general under Ptolemy. But then, he, and he, when, when a battle is fought, a great battle, he is the one who actually is the one who comes up with the whole battle plan. And so he is really the one who succeeds not Ptolemy himself, and that's why it describes it as it does here. Then what takes place after all of this is that a diplomatic marriage is arranged between the two kingdoms because they keep on fighting back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. You know, one goes up and they kind of defeat them. Uh, and come back, and then the other one comes down, and, and sometimes they win, sometimes they lose, and it just keeps on going back and forth. And so the king of the south, who is known as Ptolemy Philadelphicus, kind of like Philadelphia, gave his daughter Bernice in marriage to the king of the north, his name with Antiochus Theos. Theos, he's calling himself a god. Now, in order for this all to work out, the king of the north, who is married, 
has to divorce his wife to marry the daughter from the south. So they get a divorce. And uh, her name was Laosi. I think I'm going to say it, L-A-O-D-I-C-E. But then the king of the south, Ptolemy, dies. And so the king of the north, Antiochus, who divorced his wife to marry the Egyptian, who's really not an Egyptian, by the way, because she's really an, a, a Greek, because these people are all Greeks who've taken over everything. Uh, when, uh, when, the, when the king dies, Antiochus takes back his first wife. He takes back his first wife, and so the daughter of the king of the south of Egypt doesn't have any more of, uh, influence on him. Well, his first wife comes back in, and a woman scorned. She kills her husband. She kills the son that is born to him and the, the daughter from, the, from Egypt. And, um, and, of course, the Egyptian wife. So she wipes them all out, and then her own son then is on the throne. And by the way, these people, don't, they don't forget nothing. And there's a whole lot of other things that take, take place here. And by the way, uh, Alexander, uh, he has, uh, I think he, was, he had three sons. Uh, none of them will, uh, will uh, inherit anything. One of them was uh, uh, mentally, uh, had mental issues and something. Um, and uh, one was murdered. I think they all eventually were possibly murdered. And I forget what the, the third one, I, I, I can't remember at all. Uh, so we come now to the third period. And that's from 233 to 187 B.C. And that's found in chapter 11, verses 10 through 19. So, Gabriel now speaks of some detail about Antiochus, who is called the third. Uh, he's also called Antiochus the Great. And the struggles he's going to have with the kings, the kings now, of Egypt. Now, at first, Antiochus is very, very successful. He takes control of Palestine from the Egyptians. And you need to understand how important that land is. When you look at a map of the Middle East, and you look, and of course you have the Jordan River, and then you have the Mediterranean River, and you'll notice that, you know, you have the lands above, you have the lands below, but everything narrows there. And so the caravan routes for centuries went up and down and, of course, would come across. They would come across from the east, they would come to the Mediterranean, and then they would uh, have these ships that would go right along the coast up north and south, but also the caravans would be coming all the way down from what we call Turkey, all the way down to Egypt, coming down even into Persia and all those areas. So this is an extremely valuable, valuable place. And when armies needed to move, they had to go through there. So whoever controlled Palestine really had a great advantage of their, over everybody else. But later, he was decisively defeated by Raphia on the southern Palestinian border by Ptolemy IV, who is known as Ptolemy Philopater. And that is found in verses 11 and 12. 
And the king of the south shall be moved with rage and go out and fight with him, that is the king of the north, with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemies. When he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up and he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. Now, some years afterwards, allied with the Philip V of Macedonia. Now, remember Macedonia. Macedonia, way back, was the home of Alexander the Great. Antiochus returns to wage war with Ptolemy V, known as Ptolemy Epiphanes, just like, just like the other Epiphanes. He's of Egypt. I know this can get a little confusing after a while because they keep on exchanging names. Now Antiochus this time is victorious, having also been aided by Jews who little realized the Syrian victory, what it would count for them. Uh, what the Bible says here, the title that they're given to them could be translated robbers, uh, it could also be translated uh, with the idea that they're turncoats or something like that. They are uh, not some of the Jewish religion, but they're, they're Jewish men who uh, think that they're doing Israel a great deal of good by uh, joining with the Syrians to go against Egypt, and that if they do that, then Israel will be set free. Duh doesn't happen. They will be treated better, but they will not be treated to freedom. They will still be in bondage. Well, the Syrians have a victory. Verses 14 through 16. Now in those times many shall arise against the king of the south, Egypt. Also violent men of your people, those are the ones who are Jews who will join with them, violent ones, uh, of your people, that is of Israel, shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and build a siege mound, take a fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist, that is the king of the south. But he who comes against him uh, shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. The glorious land, of course, is Israel, or known as Palestine at that time. At this point, Egypt loses total control of Israel, of Palestine, of all of that area. Well, another diplomatic marriage is arranged between these two groups. Antiochus gives his wife Cleopatra. But stop. Don't jump to conclusions. This is Cleopatra the first. This is not the Cleopatra that you're thinking of who gets to run around with Anthony and Caesar and all those guys. This is not her. She's a great, great, great grandmother. Okay? Or grand... No, no. She's a grandmother. She's a grandmother. So she is given to be the wife of Ptolemy V. So first the Egyptians send a wife up to Syria. Now the Syrians send the wife down to Egypt. This takes place in 192 BC. You see that in verse 17. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him, thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women to destroy it, but she shall not stand with him or be in him. So her father sends her down 
to be the wife of the king. Figuring, all right, I've got a spy there in the government. I've got an influence there. I'm going to know what's going on. I'm going to be able to eventually take Egypt. They can't get over the fact that they don't rule one another. Well, she goes off and does something really bizarre. She falls in love with her husband. And so instead of supporting her dad, she supports her husband. Still, Antiochus had not had enough of conquest. Well, he can't get Egypt at this point. So then he conquered many of the islands of the Aegean Sea and had very uh, great successes in Greece. But then he is defeated by the Roman army under Lucius Cornelius Scipio, or sometimes known as Scipio Asitasus. When Antiochus returned in disgrace because he uh, loses, um, he gets to a temple and he plunders it. In the process of plundering it, he's killed. And we find this in verses 18 and 19. After this, he shall turn his face to the coastland and shall take many. But a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end, and with the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. So, you ready for a test? <laughs> I'm not. I really made this as brief as possible, believe it or not. Uh, I've been reading this and studying this and going over this. <clears throat> this would take weeks and weeks to cover all of this. But we're going to stop here at this point. Um, and hopefully I will make a note. Uh-oh. You went too far ahead? Oh, you went to period four. We're going to stop where he got murdered. Yeah. For plundering a temple. Yeah. Hold on. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you that <clears throat> as we look back over almost 2,500 uh, more years, more than that, uh, about 35, we see your prophecies given to Daniel, every one of them coming about exactly. And what an encouragement, Lord, that is to us, because as we read your word, we see your prophecies, we know that you all, you know history because you are the creator of history. You are the author of history. And we know that these things that have taken place, that other things that haven't been fulfilled yet will also take place. What a blessing that is. Wonderful to be able to see these things. And I realize, Lord, that this is kind of a, a history lesson, and yet it's very important because when we go back and read these verses clearly and distinctly, we see how all of this is, was fulfilled. And we thank you for that. And may we truly worship you because you are the God of the universe. <clears throat> you are the creator of this earth. You are the one who has uh, prophesied the future because you are the author of the future. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.